Okay, I think it's uh, time to start now. Uh, I'm going to finish off uh, a couple of things that I didn't do in the last lecture. And this is uh, one very interesting result which we will prove in a later lecture. This is known as the Weiss zone law. Now, first of all, the meaning of a zone. A zone simply means a set of planes which share a common direction. Okay, so here, for example, you have this green, blue, and purple plane, and they share this common direction, and this is called the zone axis. So the normals to all of these planes are at 90 degrees to this axis. Okay, so a zone simply means a set of planes which share a common direction. Now, the Weiss zone law says that if you have a direction UVW which lies inside the plane HKL, so for example, this, di this direction lies in this plane, okay? So this is UVW and this is HKL, the Miller indices, then UH plus VK plus WL must equal to zero. So I'm not proving this right now, but we will do this, uh, a very simple proof when we've done the reciprocal lattice. And the good thing about this is that it applies to any crystal system, whether it's cubic or whether it's triclinic. The rule holds for any crystal system that UH plus VK plus WL equals zero if a direction UVW lies in a plane HKL. Okay? And the second thing to note is that this is the cubic system. And this is the 110 direction, and this is the 110 plane. The 110 direction lies exactly at 90 degrees to the 110 plane. Okay? Now that's true for the cubic system that if you have a plane HKL, then its normal will also have the indices HKL. But it's not generally true. Uh, so as soon as I lose the symmetry of the cube. Yeah, so this is, for example, an orthorhombic system. And this is this direction, the 110 direction, is no longer at 90 degrees to the 110 plane. Okay? Now, it may be true that in some cases, like, for example, the 100 direction, it is at 90 degrees to the 100 plane. But it's not generally true that the 110 direction will be at 90 degrees to the 110 plane. That's only true for the cubic system, which has a high level of symmetry. OK, so bear that in mind, that when we are working with cubic systems, it's easy to identify where the normal to a plane lies, because it's basically the indices of the plane. But that's not generally true in the case of uh, other systems. Now, today's lecture is going to be about stereograms. So, <coughs> stereographic projections. And stereographic projections are a way of imagining things on two dimensions instead of looking at relationship between directions and planes and so on in three dimensions. Now, just to show you what I mean, this is, of course, uh, our Earth. And it's hard, hard to imagine uh, you know, what's on the other side and so forth. So what we do is we do a projection. Okay, so this is a two-dimensional distortion of a spherical Earth. Yeah. We are going to do this for crystals and relationships between crystals. But let me begin with a question. Okay? If I have two points. Uh, let's say I'm going from, what's the capital of Saudi Arabia? Anyone know? Riyadh. Riyadh. Okay, so if we go from Riyadh to Delhi, how would you measure the shortest distance? Or on, on this sphere, if I want to go from Riyadh to Delhi, how would I measure the shortest distance? Yeah? Would it be this way? <coughs> How? Certainly, if I look over here, this is a, a distortion. Yeah? So I can't say, actually, that this point is a shorter distance from this point than between these two. Yeah? 
I mean, after all, over here, there's a huge distortion. All right? This should really be a single point here. So any idea how on a sphere I would measure the shortest distance between two points? Yeah, the angle certainly uh, gives you information, but what would the shortest distance be? You're, you're quite right, you're on the right track. How would I measure the shortest distance? Which line would I choose? It's got to be a diameter of the Earth. So what you've got to do is you've got to locate a diameter so that it passes through Riyadh and through New Delhi, and that gives you the shortest distance. Okay? So a straight line on a sphere is the diameter of the sphere, okay? or what we call a great circle, the circle with the largest radius. Okay? So those concepts will come into stereograms, which I'm going to talk about next. But I want to show you, first of all, uh, some applications of stereograms because people often ask, you know, what is the use of studying stereograms? So before I explain stereograms, I'll show you some important applications. You won't understand them fully as yet, but you will by the time we finish this course, okay? Right, so this, for example, is a single crystal of alpha brass, and you, you're deforming it so you can see these slip planes, uh, the slip lines caused at the free surface. So these are classical experiments done by Schmidt and Boas, who did a lot of the original work on the plasticity of single crystals in Australia. And we have uh, two problems here. First of all, this is a single crystal, so it's easy to define the crystal axes. Yeah? We know that the 1, 0, 0 direction is here, here, and here. But we are also interested in the sample axes. That means we are pulling along this direction, and the normal to the pulling direction is along here. But we need to show in three dimensions the relationship between the crystal axes and the sample axes. And that's how we, uh, we will do that on stereograms. <coughs> I, I showed you this slide yesterday, which is a single crystal nickel-based superalloy turbine blade. Now, this is rotating at a very, very high speed. I think it's something of the order of uh, 30,000 revolutions per minute in a jet engine. And the smallest amount of vibration can destroy your engine, right? Now, the elastic modulus is anisotropic because it's a single crystal. So what they do is they grow these blades along crystallographic directions where the modulus will be such that the vibrations are minimized. So it's extremely clever technology. To represent the variation of the modulus or other properties as a function of the crystal axis, we can use stereograms. Again, this is a three-dimensional object and I don't know what's going on behind, right? So we want to actually see things in two dimensions. This is a, another example which many of you will come across if you do any kind of transmission electron microscopy. So this, for example, is the orientation relationship between ferrite and cementite, and it's known as the Bagayaski orientation relationship. You can express it like this. If you plot it on a stereogram, then you can find the relationships between any planes and any directions uh, once you have determined a few basic parallelisms between the two crystal structures. So it's a way of visualizing the orientation relationship. And then when you're on the electron microscope, you know, when you analyze the diffraction pattern immediately, you can start to see relationships between the crystals. Okay. So this is a very important application from a material science point of view. Then, of course, we are interested in polycrystalline materials. Okay. So I want to show what the orientation of this crystal is relative to my rolling direction or, or uh, forging direction, etc. And I want to plot the orientations of every single crystal in this polycrystalline aggregate as a function of those rolling 
directions and transverse directions. So this, this is very important from the point of view of formability because it defines what's known as the texture of the material. And we'll do this in a little bit more detail later on. So we want to express the orientations of grains in polycrystalline samples relative to the sample axis. By sample axis, I mean if you're rolling a sheet, then it's the rolling direction, the thickness direction, and the transverse direction. Yeah. And in order to interpret diffraction patterns, we can combine uh, diffraction patterns and stereograms to give us a three-dimensional visualization of what's going on. Okay? So all of these are very important applications of stereograms, which you will appreciate as the course goes on. Okay? But today's lecture is just to introduce you to stereographic projections. OK, so the first thing I want to do is I want to prove that a bar 2 axis is equivalent to a mirror. Now, what does the 2 in this bar 2 stand for? Dyad. It's, it's correct. It's, it's a dyad. So that means we are rotating by 180 degrees and? With an inversion. And then we have an inversion through the center. Do you remember the inversion axis? So you start from here, there's a center of symmetry, and you invert it through the center, right? Yeah, do you remember that? OK, so I want to prove that a rotation of 180 degrees followed by an inversion through the center is exactly the same as a mirror plane, right? So I've got a sphere here. And this is the equatorial plane of the sphere. Okay, and these are just two, uh, three sets of axes. And I identify an arbitrary point inside the sphere. Okay, so I've labeled it as one. If I project that point through the south pole, then I get this point on the equatorial plane. And I represent that on a two-dimensional circle as that point. So that point corresponds to that point. Yeah, everybody clear about that? So this is an arbitrary point. I'm projecting it through the south pole, and it intersects the equatorial plane here. So I plot it on my circle. Right, now I'm going to turn it by 180 degrees. So when I, when I rotate it about, about this axis by 180 degrees, I get this point here. And when I project it again through the south pole, I get that point there. Okay? So you can see this is 180 degrees rotation about the axis pointing out of the plane of the board. Everyone happy? Okay. Now I'm going to invert it through the center. Okay, so here, first I rotate by 180 degrees, I get this. I invert it through the center, I get a pole in the lower hemisphere, right? That's why it's labeled as a circle, because it now lies in the lower hemisphere. Points 1 and 2 are in the upper hemisphere, so they're filled dots, and this is in the lower hemisphere, and therefore I'm plotting it here, okay? So this point is the original point, this point is derived by a rotation of 180 degrees, and then I invert it through the center, I get a point in the lower half. Yeah. Now, can you see that that's a equivalent to a mirror plane? And where is the mirror plane? The equatorial plane is the mirror plane, because look, that's a reflection of that. Okay. So we have proved that bar 2 is the same as a mirror plane at 90 degrees to the diet. Everybody happy with that? There's one thing you haven't noticed, is that when I got this pole in the lower hemisphere, I actually projected it through the north pole, because it doesn't make sense to project through the south pole. Yeah? So anything lying in the lower hemisphere, you project through the north pole. Anything lying in the upper hemisphere, you project through the south pole. This is the stereographic representation of the operation bar 2. Okay, So it's not terribly difficult. Anything that lies in the upper hemisphere is identified as a black dot, filled black dot. And anything that lies in the lower hemisphere is a circle. And these ones you project through the North Pole, these ones you project through the South Pole to find where it lies on the equatorial plane. 
Everyone happy with that? Okay. Right, so just some definitions now. When we wanted to find the shortest distance between Riyadh and New Delhi, what we did was we located a diameter of the Earth passing through both those points, right? Because on a sphere, a straight line is the same as the diameter. So any circle which has the diameter of our stereographic uh, sphere is known as a great circle. Okay, so a great circle has the diameter which is equal to that of the sphere. So if you want to measure angles between two points on the sphere, then those two points must be located on the great circle, exactly like the distance between Riyadh and New, New Delhi. Yeah? So if I have two arbitrary points on top of the sphere, then I've got to move this great circle so that both those points lie on that sphere in order to measure the angle between them. Any circle which has a diameter which is less than that of the sphere is known as a small circle. Straightforward. Yeah? So these two are small circles of a stereographic projection. Okay? Right, now what we want to do is some crystallography. So I've got this sphere in three dimensions and I locate my uh, cubic crystal in this case at the center of the sphere. And I draw the normals to the cube faces. Right. So that's 1, 0, 0, that's 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So this is the conventional way in which you put the axes, that the x-axis is pointing this way, the y-axis this way, and the z-axis vertically. Okay. I'm now going to draw a plane inside our cubic crystal. Okay. Which plane is this? Zero, one, one? Which one is it? Try again. It's not zero, one, one. Oh, sorry, you are right, yeah. Uh, you are right, okay. It doesn't intersect this axis at all. It intersects the y-axis at one and the z-axis at one. Good. Uh, so it's the zero, one, one plane. And I want to represent the normal to that plane on a stereogram, okay? So first of all, I want to draw the normal to the zero, one, one plane. Okay, so there's the normal. What do I do next? You know, hmm? Projection through the South Pole, right? So here I go, projection through the South Pole, and where it intersects the equatorial plane, that is the point representing the 0, 1, 1 plane. Okay? So I've got my equatorial plane, and I've got a point which identifies where the 0, 1, 1 plane is. I can do this for any number of planes. Yeah. This is the opposite, is the zero bar one bar one plane. Okay, so uh, the only, only difference is that the normal is pointing in the opposite direction. So I project it through the North Pole and I identify that as a circle. Yeah. So we had the pole of the zero one one over here and the pole of the zero bar one bar one over here, but identified as a circle. Now, in addition to the normal to the plane, which is what we plotted in the previous slide, you know, the dot represents the normal to a plane, right? I'd like to actually show the trace of the plane, okay? Now, if I, if I take this blue plane and I extend it, then it will become this, this plane here, right? It's exactly still the 0, 1, 1 plane. So all I've done is I've taken this blue plane and made it larger so that it intersects the sphere. So we had the normal to the plane and this is the plane itself and where it cuts the sphere 
is called the trace of the plane. All right. So let me just go back a few slides. So here, this is a slip plane, isn't it? Yeah, and let's assume that it's a 1, 1, 1 slip plane because it's alpha brass. Then these lines here, where they intersect the cylindrical crystal, are called the traces. Yeah? It's the intersection of two planes. It's called a trace. Yeah. So similarly, if I extend this plane so that it intersects the sphere, then wherever it cuts the sphere is called a trace. Okay? If I take any point on that trace and do the same, uh, for example, this point, and project it through the south pole, I'll get a point on the, uh, on the great circle here. And then I do it for every single point on this circle, and I get this curve here, which is called the trace of the 110 plane. Okay? So previously, we plotted the normal here, and this is the trace of the plane. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Okay, so what's the angle between the normal and the trace? 90 degrees. So if I, if I measure the angle between this and this, or this and this, or this and this, everywhere, it will be 90 degrees. <coughs> so on the stereogram, we can plot the normal to the plane, and we can actually plot the plane itself, yeah? the trace of the plane. OK? Right. So what we are doing on the stereogram is measuring angles, right? You saw that uh, you know, the angle between the normal and the trace is 90 degrees everywhere. So on the flat equatorial plane, we are measuring angles. And there is a construction called the wolf net, which you can superimpose onto your stereogram and just measure off angles from that. So here, uh, the calibration is in five degrees. Okay? So you have a number of poles on your stereogram, and you can put the wolf net on top and measure the angles. It's just like using a, a protractor, but in a different way. Yeah. So all of these here are great circles. That means they have the diameter of the sphere. Yeah. And similarly, this one is a great circle as well. These are small circles. They don't have the diameter. They have a diameter less than that of the sphere. OK? So this wolf net, you can, you can just download, uh, or, or they're available. You can buy them as transparent sheets, yeah? And then rotate them and measure the angle between Riyadh and Delhi, or, or what 110 pole and 111 pole, and so forth. Now. These are great circles, okay? And I want you to uh, I want to show you what the diameter of these circles is, okay? So we are going to calculate the diameter of each of these circles. This one has the diameter exactly that of the sphere, but these are arcs of circles of bigger diameter, yeah? And this particular one has an infinite diameter. Okay, so I'll just show you that these are actually arcs of circles with diameters greater than that of the stereographic sphere. So for any, any uh, circle, if I'm looking at a particular arc, and this is the distance x and this is the distance y, then I can find the radius in terms of x and y through the simple Pythagoras theorem application. right? So if I'm looking at an arc, and I know the distance x, and I know the distance y, then I can work out the radius easily. So in our wolf net, um, this is the center. This would be the distance x, and this would be the distance y. So from that, we can work out the radius of any one of these circles. That's how the wolf net is plotted in the first place. So, this is now our stereogram. 
which has the diameter of the equatorial plane on the sphere. And this is one of those great circles. Yeah? And it actually is a circle which has a greater diameter than our stereogram. And this distance and this distance give us the radius of that arc. Yeah? So just, just to explain to you that on the wolf net, those are arcs of circles in general of a diameter greater than that of the sphere. Now, uh, if I give you an arbitrary pole, okay, let's, let's say this one, then I can find the trace of that plane by looking at something which is at 90 degrees to it. Okay, so this is the trace of this particular pole. And this angle is 90, this angle is 90, this angle is 90, and so on. It doesn't look like that, does it? That if I measure the angle here, I can imagine it to be 90, but if I go over here, it doesn't look like 90 degrees, does it? Why is that? Because, you know, you have to measure angles by putting the two points on a great circle. So if I, if I take this point and I take this point, then I've got to follow it along a great circle. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Do you see? And similarly here, this is a, a great circle here. So I go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So we're not measuring as lines, but measuring angles along great circles. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? Similarly, if I have two points, A and B, to measure the angle between them, I've got to rotate my wolf net until both the points lie on one of these great circles. And then I can measure the angle as 10, 20, and 26 <coughs> degrees, right? So I have my stereogram, I have two poles on it, and I want to measure the angle, then I've got to rotate the wolf net until a great circle lies on both of those points. And then I measure off the angle between those two poles. Right? Okay, so uh, this is a, a little movie showing you the operation. <coughs> Incidentally, you know, if you downloaded the PDF file, yeah, then the PDF file is actually hyperlinked. So if you click on the things, you'll be able to see the movies. It'll go automatically to the website and so forth. Yeah. Right, so what, what, what I'm going to show you is the operation of measuring the angle. Now this is a particularly simple case because the pole of interest lies on, on this horizontal line. So that was the pole, and that is its trace. Okay. Now if you go to the next... Uh, right, this time I want to measure... Uh, uh, I want to know where the trace of the 111 pole here lies. So all I do is I plot the pole on there, and then I rotate the wolf net until I find 90 degrees here on this straight line, and that gives me this trace, right? So every point on there is at 90 degrees if I count along a great circle. And a little bit more complicated example where I want to measure the angle between two poles. So I begin with, whoops, a daisy. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. So I have these two poles. I rotate the wolf net until both of them lie on a great circle. And then I can simply measure the angle there. Okay. Everyone happy with that? The operation of the wolf net relative to the stereogram?
Okay, now uh, the small circle. So, a small circle is a circle with a diameter which is less than that of your stereographic sphere. So here, for example, is a small circle. And every point on that small circle can be projected in the same way. So here I'm projecting every point. Because this lies in the upper hemisphere, I'm projecting every point on this through the south pole. And when I do that, I get a true circle on our stereographic projection. Okay, so this is actually a circle. But the complication is because of the angular distortion, you can see angles here are nearer than angles towards the edge. Yeah, the spacing for five degrees is bigger near the edge than near the center. So there's an angular distortion. Because of that, the geometrical center of this circle will not coincide with the angular center. Okay? So geometrical center is simply you know, where you have equal distance in all directions. The angular center is where you have equal angles in all directions. And because of this distortion that angles are more uh, compressed near the center, the angular center will not correspond to the geometrical center. Yeah? Now, what is the point of a small circle? Well, I've got two poles on my stereographic projection, okay? Two normals. And I want to find another pole which is exactly at the same angle to P1 and P2. So, or, or which makes specific angles phi1 and phi2 to P1 and P2. So I first of all draw a small circle around P1 where everything is at an angle phi1 from P1. And here everything is at an angle phi2 to P2. And where they intersect, you've got two solutions of a pole which will be phi1 from P1 and phi2 from P2. Okay, so you can do that construction using small circles to find something which is at a constant angle to your particular pole. Yeah. And here we have again our poles P1 and P2 and these are the traces of P1 and P2. So for example on this trace, everything is at 90 degrees to P1, and on this trace, everything is at 90 degrees to P2, and the intersection is one of those solutions which I illustrated in the last slide. Okay. Right. Let's uh, now have the first application of the stereographic projection. Okay. So we've learned how to construct the stereographic projection. We've learned about uh, you know, anything lying in the upper hemisphere projects through the south pole, anything lying in the lower hemisphere projects through the north pole, and anything in the lower hemisphere is identified as an open circle, upper hemisphere as a filled circle. <coughs> and we have seen that we can plot the poles of a plane, that means the normal of a plane, and we can plot the trace of a plane, and similarly we can identify you know, normals which are at a constant angle to a particular pole by drawing small circles. And there are many, many ways in which you can use this and you'll, you'll become very, <coughs> very familiar with all this as we progress through the course. But what we are going to do now is to use the stereogram to represent the symmetry axes that we did in the last lecture. So this, this is a, a cube and we are looking at different directions. So what direction am I looking along for this picture? <coughs> Sorry? One zero, zero. one zero zero is going through the plane of the board. Um, this is also one zero zero, but uh, you can see that this direction here is what? One one, one one zero type direction. And which direction are we looking at along here? <coughs> yeah, the, the di body diagonal. <coughs> okay? So, what is the rotation axis here, po poking out of the plane of the board? Uh, no, I mean, what is the symmetry? What is the symmetry of this rotation axis? Tetrad, yeah, a fourfold. Uh, how about uh, the horizontal axis here?
Louder? Twofold. Twofold, yeah, so a dyad. And what about this axis here? It's a triad, yeah? So 120 de degree rotation brings you to the same point from here to here. This is a little bit misleading because these three points are underneath and these three points are above. So we need to do a rotation of 120 degrees to get from here to here, okay? <clears throat> right, so this is the stereographic representation of the symmetry elements and this is the stereogram. And I'd like to first focus on this one, right? So this is the stereogram of a cube. The conventional way of plotting this is that we put the x-axis at the bottom. Okay, so this is 1, 0, 0. This is 0, 1, 0, the y-axis. And the z-axis is pointing out of the plane of the board. All right, so let's just do that. Okay, so when you start plotting a stereogram, you, uh, and this is for a cube, you put the x-axis at the bottom, the y-axis over here, and this is uh, zero, zero, 001. Now, strictly speaking, I'm not plotting the axis, but I'm plotting the poles, but in a cube, 100 zero, zero direction is the same as a 100 zero, zero plane normal, right? Okay, now I want to plot the 110 normals. Okay, now 110 makes an angle of what to 001? Yeah, so I want to plot the 110 pole, all right? So it makes an angle of 45 degrees, right? So I could, I could actually draw a small circle here which is at 45 degrees, yeah? But can we be a little bit more clever? One, one, zero. So this is the same as adding one, zero, zero, and zero, one, zero. Okay, adding one, zero, zero, and that. Sorry, the 45 degrees is wrong. It's 90 degrees, yeah? Because that makes 90 degrees to that. You know, if you take a dot product of 0, 0, 001 and 110, it's 0. Yeah? So, so this must lie on this diameter. And if I, if I add this and this, that means that I must get 110 over here. Is everybody happy with that? That 110 must lie over there? Yeah? Okay, so where is bar one, bar one, zero? Directly opposite, right? That's bar one, bar one, zero. Now, we've got four-fold symmetry here. Therefore, I must also have the same poles here and here. So what would, uh, uh, let's label this as O1, O bar one, O. What would this be? Yep. Oh, uh, sorry. One bar one zero, and this one bar one, bar one one zero. Okay. Right. Where is O one one? So zero one one. Yeah, 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 you, you've got it right. Between this and this, right? So I measure 45 degrees, will it be exactly halfway? No, why? Because of the angular distortion, so it'll be, it'll be nearer to this point than this point, okay? But it's, in angle terms, it's 45 degrees, yeah? So I put uh, zero, one, one over here. We've got four-fold symmetry, that means I must have another 0, 1, 1 here, here, and here, right? And this one will be um, bar 1, 0, 0. So this here will be um, bar 1, 0, 1, okay? This one will be 1, 0, 1, 
And here we will have 0 bar 1, 1. Yeah? If I want to draw the trace of this, then I've got to find all angles which are at 90 degrees to that, right? Or all points which are at 90 degrees. Well, these two make 90 degrees. These two make 90 degrees. OK? So I draw the trace of that pole as that. Yeah? Similarly, because we've got four-fold symmetry, right? What is this pole? How did you get that? Yeah, if I add this and this, right? I've got one, one, one. So similarly, this will be a one, 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 a one, 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 and notice there's three-fold symmetry there. Okay, so that's how we get this stereogram here. You can see the, these are the body diagonals corresponding to triads. So we've got a triad here. Yeah, that's the symbol you would use for a triad. These are um, dyads, and that's the symbol for a dyad, 180 degrees rotation. And these are fourfold axes. So, so you can see that if I rotate the stereogram by 90 degrees, it doesn't change, right? OK, so we plotted now the symmetry elements of a cube on a stereogram. Everyone happy with that? OK. Now, in this case, you quickly identified this as 1, 1, 1, because if I add those two up, I get that, right? Because, you know, if you've defined two vectors, you can find any other vector by a, a linear combination. But strictly speaking, we, we need to verify that the angles here are correct. Yeah? Or you find another great circle in which you get the same result. So 101 plus 010 will also give me 111. So that's uniquely identified now, because I've got two great circles giving me the same result. But if I asked you to plot the 135 pole, that would be a bit tricky, yeah? Because you wouldn't be able to easily find two great circles which add up to 135. So in that case, how would you plot the pole? So if I asked you to plot the 135 pole, how would you do it? Notice that these, by the way, these are the sort of things that you get from your EBSD system. These are the stereographic triangles, the so-called stereographic triangles, right? Where, where, you know, you identify a blue color here and a red color here and a green color here. So how would I plot the 135 pole? Well, if, if I work out the angle that 135 makes with these three axes, then I can plot it using my wolf net. Yeah? And you can work out the angle how? How do you work out the angle between 135 and 100? You use a dot product. OK? Is everybody happy with the stereogram? So here is a, a plot with many, many poles on it. Yeah? So I, I'm not sure where 135 would come, but you can see um, you can find relations between any, any poles. I can measure the angle between this and this by rotating the wolf net. Yeah? Uh, if, I, if I wanted to look at uh, twin planes, in, in a body-centered cubic material, the twin plane is 112, then you can see there's a 121 plane. Okay? These are the uh, slip directions in body-centered cubic, okay? the 111 type directions. and the slip planes can be 110 type planes. So you know that there are, there are 12 of these 110 type planes. Okay. Uh, going back to this uh, slide that I started with, where this is a zone axis and this is a set of planes whose normals are at 90 degrees to the zone axis. Supposing I have a 110 zone axis, 
okay, in my electron diffraction pattern. Then, so, so the electron beam is coming along 110, okay? Then if I identify everything that is at 90 degrees to that 110, then I should see these reflections on my electron diffraction pattern, okay? So let's just construct the 110 electron diffraction pattern, okay? So this is the 110 diffraction pattern. So if I, if I go to this point, I should see, you know, 110 first of all on my pattern. So this is a 110 zone axis. So the electron beam is coming along 110. Now I ought to be able to find, therefore, a spot. This is the central spot, and that is one bar one zero. And on the opposite side, there will be bar one one zero. I now need to find just one more reflection, and the whole pattern is solved because you only need two two uh, points to work out what all the rest of the points. So it's it's convenient then to choose another one at 90 degrees, which is, which is also on this, yeah? So that's zero, zero, 001. Now, should I plot zero, zero, 001 on there at 90 degrees? So let's assume we are working with body-centered cubic. Okay. Un unfortunately, you don't get a zero, zero, 001 reflection with body-centered cubic. You get a zero, zero, 002, yeah? Do you know why? Yeah, it's it's a missing reflection because look, uh, if I draw the projection of my body-centered cubic crystal structure, and this is at a half height, the one zero zero planes will reflect. Okay, but these will reflect exactly half a wavelength out of phase, so you get destructive interference. So you do not get one zero zero reflection, but you get. 002 reflection, okay? So I can plot on here 002 and 00 bar 2, okay? What will this point be? This one. This is a vector here, okay? And this is a vector here. And this vector is the sum of this and this. So it's one bar one, two. So let's see if we can find one bar one, two. There you go. Zero, zero, one, one bar one, two, one bar one, one uh, zero, okay? So immediately, just by looking at this diagram, yeah, you can analyze your diffraction pattern. And furthermore, you know that this is a dyad, right? Therefore, this pattern also has to be a dyad. So this is a, a rectangle. Yeah, you can see this distance here is different from this distance here. So this is not a fourfold axis, this is a twofold axis. Yeah? So, you know, if, while you are on the electron microscope, you can look at the diffraction pattern, see what symmetry it is, and if you have a stereogram handy, you can try and analyze the pattern while you're looking at it. Yeah? Is everyone happy with that? Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.